Good to be here with y'all virtually. I wish I could have been out there in person. Uh, I was really looking forward to that, but it's uh, it's crunch time out here on the farm. We're literally just uh, got our first rounds of plants. I, uh, I work for a farm in Humboldt County called Farming Humboldt Dreams, and it's a, it's a brand new farm coming online this year. And it's been uh, an extremely large amount of work to really get to where we're at. And it was kind of uh, delayed a little bit. So I had to stick around to um, be here for planting. I had to, had to be here for that. So I uh, hope to make it out there, you know, in the future. So uh, Rogue Natural Farming is my company. I uh, started this in 2020. And uh, it was kind of a, basically a, a synthesis of the regenerative farming practices I've been doing for uh, the better part of the last 10 years. Um, I've been farming and gardening, um, doing some animal husbandry um, and using permaculture, uh, as, as a profession. So I do this as an occupation. This isn't a hobby. Um, this is what I do for a living. And, um, you know, for me, it really started first with permaculture. You know, I moved out to Humboldt County in 2011. In a previous life, I was a, a architectural draftsman, which I think kind of gave me some uh, understanding for design and kind of the bigger picture design protocol. So permaculture really resonated with me, that overarching design. And living off grid, living in the hills in Humboldt, uh, you know, I wasn't used to that. I came from a city. I'd been living in Salt Lake City, Utah before that and uh, had a completely different life. And that life kind of collapsed in 2008, 2009 during the bust of the economy. Um, and so it, it sent me on this whole new path, uh, that I'm on now and really started with permaculture, but through permaculture and regenerative farming, I found Korean natural farming, um, and really have to give credit to a girl named Val Harriman, who is in Florida and her and her boyfriend started doing YouTube videos. And, uh, I watched her videos um, of their projects doing permaculture. And at the end of one of those videos, she had a compost pile, uh, which came to be known as uh, IMO, indigenous microorganisms. And she was talking about Korean natural farming and how you can culture these microorganisms to build your soil. And from there, I just keyword searched it, got into, um, you know, looking into to KNF and found some of Chris Trump's video. So he was kind of my point of entry originally and then got to go out and meet him in person and take his classes so I've, I've really traveled all over to Hawaii with Jason um, I've been blessed to be part of uh, a couple of those um, different um, workshops we've done some in Williams Oregon where I lived for the past three years uh, now I just moved back to Humboldt County so um, that's a little bit about me um, see here. So my website is Rogue Natural Farming and you can find more resources on here. I do sell some of these inputs uh, and pesticides, Jadam pesticides, but really that's not my primary intention is to be a teacher and teach folks how to do that. What I have realized is that you know, there's, there's a lot of people interested in this, but uh, they might not exactly have the time to do everything. So if I can help kind of jumpstart them on their path, I love doing that. But my intention is not to be a fertilizer salesman by any means. I want to see everybody making their own. So uh, Rogue Natural Farming, you can find more information on here. I have treatment charts. These are all standard um, Korean natural farming charts that I've put together for previous workshops um, and you can find more information on here. I also have a YouTube channel, Rogue Natural Farming, uh, and I have just a bunch of material and content I've been distilling down. Um, and uh, so there'll be a lot more to come on, on this channel. Awesome. Um, picture with uh, Master Cho a few years ago. Um, <laughs> 
Jason was there too. I wish I had a picture of the whole table. We we were lucky to have sushi with the Cho family after a Williams, Oregon uh, sold out venue. Um, Jason really, um, you know, brought the Cho family in 2020. And uh, well, yeah, was that 2020, Jason? The 2019. 2019. 2019. 2019. That's right. Yeah. And um, it was really a real blessing to have, you know, Master Cho and his son, Young San Cho, who's the founder of Jadam and their family, uh, and really learn from them directly. And they, he's just been a real a catalyst in, uh, in how I think and approach um, a very unorthodox way of farming, um, but it's very practical, too. So just an amazing man, Master Cho, and, and just been uh, had a real, you know, it's been a real pleasure to learn from him directly and, and get a, you know, ask him questions that have come up for me. But, you know, one thing I've, I've learned from uh, teachers like Master Cho, who kind of question the status quo, is that, you know, they're often met with a lot of resistance. And, and Master Cho is one of those peoples. He has gone to fight great odds to really share Korean nacho farming with the world. I mean, he was literally almost killed by the military um, for, for, you know, practicing Korean nacho farming. And I'm sure Jason knows uh, a lot about that and can share more about that too, but just really blessed that these teachings have, have spread, really been spreading like wildfire and really, you know, being in the middle of the Pacific ocean, Hawaii has got a lot of that from Asia. So I think that's kind of been a hotbed for a lot of this information coming to the mainland. So um, traveling out there um, has really uh, been a benefit for me in, in kind of in learning and uh, being able to practice these ways in different environments, because that's something you pick up on. There's, this is a very intuitive way of farming. So what I'm doing here in Humboldt County is going to be a little different than what's going on in North Carolina or Hawaii or in Germany. Um, now it's the same approach. It's the same kind of approach, but, but it requires that we really pay attention to the climate, the, um, the temperature, the elevation, um, the different organisms and plants in our environment that we'll be working with. So it really kind of, it's, it's a very intuitive, uh, way of farming. Um, so I love science. I think it has great things to offer, but I think reductionistic science can sometimes get very mechanical and that can kind of get us away from our natural in intuition. So uh, you can approach this as a very scientific person um, and you can approach this as more of kind of a folk method too. Um, but no doubt, um, it does require that we really tap into more of that intuitive sense. This is uh, Yang San Cho, who is, um, and Jadam Sona, who is his wife. This is Master Cho's son, who has um, given us Jadam, which is the next generation of natural farming. Yang San Cho has greatly simplified a methodology in Jadam from his dad's practices, but he very much, um, you know, he very much acknowledges his father's influence. Um, so for me, what I would like to do in this presentation is share how I'm using both KNF and Jadam in a symbiotic way. Um, but it's important to note that Korean natural farming, the traditional method and Jadam are their own separate practices. Um, I have got to speak with uh, Yang San Cho in person about his thoughts on combining the two. And I'll share what he said to me about that. Some of the books um, here, Jadam, we have the original orange book, um, wealth of information, best $30 I think I've ever spent in my life. Uh, 100 Herbs for Jadam, Natural Pesticides, that's also a good book. Um, by no means are these 100 herbs the only herbs you can use. A sky is really the limit. Um, here in California, I use um, a tree, bay laurel, California bay laurel, Californica umbellularia. Now in your region, you, you probably don't have access to this. It kind of grows on the West Coast. But I think the, the point here is that you can find what grows in your region. And this 
I kind of gleaned from the Native Americans who use this plant as a pesticide. So I did some herbalism study courses in Humboldt County and, and really look a lot to the Native American uses of, of plants. And uh, Bay Laurel has, has worked for all kinds of pests from mites to um, aphids, um, just any number of things. So the book on the right is the new one. Um, also an awesome book. It's even bigger than the original Orange Jadam book specifically on, on pest control. So Jadam has a lot to offer in the field of uh, IPM, integrated pest management and um, pesticide. So really for me, um, you know, permaculture, regenerative farming, biodynamics, um, Korean natural farming Jadam, there's a lot of different names and a lot of kind of different approaches to regenerative practices. And for me, the really golden thread there is the principles behind them. So um, some of those principles and kind of bullet points here is to source locally, is no tillage or very light tillage. And in, in the situation where you might have a pasture, for instance, that you wanna grow a new crop and there's, there's an old, um, let's say a, a hay field you want to turn into a different crop. Well, in that case, tilling could be um, a way to kind of start fresh. So it's kind of a one and done situation as far as tilling goes, but um, you know, to really maximize the potential and build soil and use these indigenous microorganisms, um, it is a no-till process. And so that's very, very important. Uh, some of the other principles here are closing loops. This is a, a big part of permaculture is, is closing loops. So that kind of goes hand in hand with sourcing locally, using the plants that we have directly around us, the materials, the resources. If you live on the coast, you already have an advantage here because there's just so much um, you can get from the ocean like kelp, fish, um, crab shells, oyster shells, all of these things can be utilized for natural farming inputs. Uh, stacking functions is another permaculture, um, you know, term where something you do is not just intended for one purpose. You, you find something that can have multiple purposes. So this is, this is also a good practice. Uh, increasing biodiversity is, is always good. And that's what we're doing with these inoculants that we're making in Jadam and Korean natural farming, the indigenous microorganisms. Um, you know, another one is to foster good relationships. This is one Master Cho talks about, foster a good relationship with your neighbors. So um, to me, that's not just like, hey, um, you know, Billy next door or, or whoever lives next to you. That's all, that, that encompasses all of the life in your surrounding area. So really paying attention to the life that exists right there in your bioregion and how you're impacting that life and how you can develop better relationships with that life. Um, you know, here um, we have a pretty severe drought and have had some serious fires in the past several years. So water wise methods is really important. So mulching is a big part of natural farming. Um, that's how we protect these indigenous microorganisms that were that we're collecting, that we're culturing, and that we're adding back to the soil. Really, you could see Korean natural farming Jadam as, yes, we're farmers of plants, but really we're, we're farmers of indigenous microorganisms because if we recognize it really starts with them in the soil, they're the ones that are, are feeding and they're the ones that are farming our crops for us, you know, because there's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship happening there. So, you know, soil science can be very complicated or it can be very simple. You can choose whatever, you know, way you want to go with that. But one thing that Yang San Cho always stresses in Jadam is that, um, you know, it's so easy. He's always saying it's so easy and you can see it as that way or you can see it as very complicated. You can get into these very complicated soil sciences where you need an agronomist and uh, a soil scientist to analyze your soil and tell you you need this, that, and the other. But um, this, this method has an amazing way of really creating balance um, just by adding the microbes, just by 
adding organic compost to the soil and letting them do the work. We don't need to play that, you know, soil scientist um, where we're identifying all of the elements and nutrients. Now, if you want to go that route, I don't discourage you, but I'm just saying you don't, you don't have to. Um, so water wise methods and really simplifying the process. Um, so I'm going to be speaking on combining Korean natural farming and Jadam. Now, I'll just say when I spoke to Yang San Cho, again, he's the founder of uh, Jadam, the son of, Korean, of uh, Master Cho, who gave us traditional KNF. I asked him in person and I said, what do you think of mixing some of your father's uh, methodology into Jadam, mixing the two? And he said, well, you have to be really careful because uh, inherently they're kind of two different uh, approaches in the sense that with first we need to decide what road we want to take here. KNF relies on solely preventative measures. Korean natural farming doesn't give us uh, a whole lot of options if we have pests. Jadam is amazing for the pest control. So really we kind of have to uh, make a decision if we want to employ mm -hmm. Jadam and KNF. Well, first of all, do you want to use strictly preventative measures and then maybe use some Jadam pesticides if you ever have issues? And that's kind of my approach. Um, or if you're going with more of a Jadam approach, what you would be doing is using a regular IPM, integrated pest management. So you'd be using a regular spray uh, of your, your pesticides here, um, whether you're seeing an issue or not. You know, Jadam, every single week you're spraying an IPM. So that's kind of the decision you have to make there. And again, I've chosen to really build resilience through polycultures, like kind of more of a permaculture way, but also these, these IMOs and um, building, building the soil, which in turn creates very um, resilient plants. So this is, again, this is the uh, approach of cr traditional Korean natural farming is preventative measures. Um, the other difference in Jadam and traditional KNF is um, anaerobic versus aerobic. So with Jadam, we are doing, using putrefaction. We're not so much fermenting. In traditional Korean natural farming, we're doing more fermentation. So we're, we're employing different microbiology here. So for me, this is another place where there's a great symbiosis with KNF and Jadam because if we learn both techniques, now we can culture um, these deeper soil horizon microbes, as well as some of these indigenous microbes for the topsoil. So, you know, there is no good or bad, right? Nature doesn't discriminate between anaerobic or aerobic. What there is, is a balance of all these healthy microorganisms. So if anybody tells you anaerobic is bad and you don't want any anaerobes, well, I mean, that's how we as humans rely, that's how we digest and assimilate food is through anaerobic processes. And they also exist in nature. There is kind of some fields of thought that, no, you gotta do all anaer or all aerobic, but I'm, I'm not convinced. And when you see uh, Yang San Cho's 10 foot tall pepper plants that are producing 200 peppers per plant, um, I don't think you can argue with him that you know, his anaerobic method of culturing is working very well. <clears throat> um, this is a traditional Korean natural farming method. I think you guys, if I'm not mistaken, you were, um, did some of this today. But uh, so here's a collection box where we use rice to essentially put a box out inside this. I chose to do kind of a hexagonal shape here with my design. Uh, but in this box here that I've placed in the topsoil, as you can see, is uh, rice that we're culturing some of the indigenous microorganisms. As, as you can see, this is from the topsoil here, and that's what we're culturing on that rice. Um, here we have uh, IMO3. This is a big aggregate. Um, and that's what fungus does in the soil. It, it creates <laughs> aggregate and it binds. <laughs> Um, so this here is a big chunk of IMO3. This is, if I go back here, this is my IMO2 collection. Now I've taken that and grown that on this substrate, which was 
milled oats, barley, um, and wheat here. And it created, this is just this fungal uh, mat, you know, this aggregate. So now we can go spread that and um, basically inoculate our, our land and our farms with, with this good IMO that will help build the topsoil. Um, so IMO is a more, the traditional can up is a more aerobic, aerobic fungal dominant culture for the topsoil. We're only really talking about the top five inches that IMO is, is used for. JMS on the other hand stands for Jadam Microbial Solution. Um, this is a method that they use in Jadam, which is using potatoes, right? Um, you can see all the bubbles here in this bucket that I made. This is like a 30 gallon batch, kind of smaller scale. And um, we cooked potatoes, used uh, forest stuff. So just collected some of that leaf mold from the forest and uh, sea salt. So Young Sancho uh, from Jadam has really simplified the process for um, culturing and inoculating uh, different IMOs, but this will be a slightly different culture than his father's method. Here, you're gonna have um, more anaerobic. Um, so that's gonna be for the deeper soil horizons. And these microbes are really great at breaking through clay and where there is no oxygen, they thrive in that environment. Um, but they're really good at um, very compacted soil. Uh, they're great at flocculating and, you know, loosening up that clay, that rock, that really hard compacted earth. They're great at uh, bringing oxygen and, and really um, creating soil. So, so this is where, again, I really love to use Jadam and KNF together. Uh, this is more of a commercial application here and a big uh, that's like a big um, 5,000 gallon um, setup I was doing on a commercial farm here. Um, so as I said, more facultative anaerobic cultures for the deeper soil horizons with the Chidal microbial solution. Um, so we're always using mulch in natural farming um, and you can choose uh, whatever mulch there, straw, leaves, wild grass, um, uh, wood chips. Now, wood chips, I always recommend that people charge those wood chips. I wouldn't recommend using um, really fresh wood chips. Uh, they have a tendency to leach out nutrients, just like biochar. And I'm going to speak to charging biochar a little bit, but charging wood chips is very similar, actually, uh, if not identical to charging um, biochar. So, uh, typically, you'd want to use raminal wood chips. Uh, raminal wood chips for mulch means that they're the branches off of trees that are, you know, three to four inches in diameter. Um, beyond that, the um, what like the trunk of a tree, if you were to chop that up and wood chip that um, versus a um, a branch off of a tree, that's it's very different um, composition of those two woods right there. The, the raminal branches have much higher mineral content to them. So it's, it's recommended that you use raminal wood chips. So with mulching, um, something that comes up often in um, Korean natural farming is the uh, golden ratio, you know, 70% um, shade to 30% light with your mulching. These numbers come up again and again. So they're good. It's a good ratio to remember. Um, so mulching is crucial. It, it uh, protects our, our microbes that we're applying to the soil. It gives them a chance to have a protective layer where they're not getting blasted with UV rays from the sun. Uh, it helps to retain moisture. Um, and you know, in a drought, um, we have to be really water wise. So I'm a huge advocate of um, mulching. Now, Sugar, sugar tends to be the biggest bone of contention that I find in traditional Korean natural farming. So I'd like to take a second to talk about sugar. Traditional Korean natural farming does use sugar, whereas Jadam does not. Um, so I think one thing to keep in mind with the sugar too is it's, it's for some people, it tends to just be this, uh, you know, it's, it's this bone of contention to where they're like, nope, we can't do can out because there's sugar. And I think, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. You know, um, 
there are ways to navigate this and and it's important to keep in mind too we're using these um these inputs right at homeopathic doses so yes we're using some sugar to make like a fermented plant juice or a fish amino acids right but we're using those inputs um at a highly diluted rate one to 500 one to a thousand which is four to eight milliliters per gallon um so that's one thing to keep in mind and how do we close that sugar loop? How do we look for ways that, okay, if we can't source sugar where we're at, or we have ethical issues with using that, well, you could grow beets. You can make your own sugars that way. Uh, if you live in a more tropical area or uh, would like to set up a greenhouse with a tropical environment, you could grow your own cane. cane. Um, I am a beekeeper. And so I've gotten into dehydrating some of my honey and I have uh, been experimenting with making fermented plant juices with dehydrated and granulated honey. Um, and this is actually what I feed my bees. To me, this is the closest that we can get to what the bees would naturally forage on in the wild, um, this nectar and, and the honey. So if sugar is an issue for you, there is some um, ways to navigate that. And if you just absolutely can't use sugar, well, then you can go with Jadam. They take the sugar out. So I'm sure you've all heard the term SOP, um, another acronym here uh, on top of all your new KNF and JADAM acronyms to learn, but standard operating procedure. This is a term that's thrown around on farms and farm management a lot. Um, and I have some things to say about SOPs. Uh, I don't use just one, it kind of depends on really the situation uh, that I'm working at like uh, with different clients and depending on um, the approach that we're going with uh, I change my SOPs around and I'll give you some examples of that here in this presentation but for me what I like to say about SOPs is, is to stop observe and then um, proceed and what I mean by that is sometimes like an SOP can kind of sound like okay we have this standard operating procedure and it can kind of get mechanical it's like every week we're doing this and it has to be this particular uh regiment um but you got to be careful you, you know korean natural farming again requires that we're really paying attention to what the plants are communicating to us so we can't get too rigid with our standard operating procedures and force these um these feeding regiments on them we really we it's good to start with uh that and and but still pay attention to what the plants are telling us and we can kind of adjust our standard operating uh procedures from there so what i'm getting at is just rather than it being this mechanical you know let's spray this every tuesday we stop we observe what the plants are telling us and then we proceed with our standard our standard operating procedure so it takes nature approximately 500 years to develop an inch of topsoil. And we can speed this evolution up to accomplish this in one year. This is really, I remember when I first heard this and it just floored me. I was like, wow, you know, and, you know, I'm somebody who um, is very interested in alchemy and, you know, alchemy, one definition is alchemy is, is evolving nature. So in the laboratory or wh wherever you want to practice that in a yogic form, um, what we're doing is speeding up the process of natural evolution. So to me, this is a form of alchemy because we can take what nature does and we can speed that up. Um, and so how can we do that? Well, here is uh, a method um, to soil build. And I've done this in uh, a farm that I, the first farm that I worked at in Oregon, uh, I went out to um, work for this farm and I was consulting them to basically put them on Korean natural farming and in Jadam. And so the first challenge I had was that I went out there and there's no, um, there's pretty much no topsoil at all. It was, it's very volcanic in that region. So there was a lot of pumice stone. There was a lot of clay. It was very compacted. So the very first thing I did, it was in the winter time and I went and really heavily mulched the whole property. And then I used Jadal microbial solution, um, fermented seawater or just seawater. 
and JLF. Now, if you only have JMS, you could just use that. But these three together are, are really amazing at building soil if you have a very compacted uh, place where you're trying to build that topsoil. And um, I was just amazed to see the transformation that happened in a matter of three months uh, where this farm had this compacted, you know, earth, like I said, and, and after three months of heavily mulching and applying JMS along with fermented seawater and Jadam liquid fertilizer, um, we were seeing topsoil. We were seeing the earthworms coming back. We were seeing life coming back. So it's really amazing how quickly you can tr uh, transform with, you know, these inoculants. Um, I heard this once and, and I love this quote that waste is a human design flaw. I heard it from the late great Toby Hemingway, the um, permaculture, the great permaculture teacher. And, and I love this, I live by this. Um, mm -hmm. Waste is a human design flaw. There is no waste in KNF, Korean Natural Farming and in Jadam. So here's a couple of things. Not only is there no waste, I always kind of joke that in Korean Natural Farming, the, the waste byproducts were making wine and cheese, literally. Um, so um, here uh, are some cheese curd balls that um, I'm on the right side there. I'm wrapping in, uh, in uh, beeswax. Um, so you can make cheese from the curds. Uh, this is a vinegar that I made. You, you literally can make wine from the leftovers of fermented plant juices. That would be an anaerobic fermentation. Uh, if you wanted to make a vinegar, you'd use an aerobic fermentation. Uh, <clears throat> so here what we have is on the bottom there, this is a, a mugwort vinegar that I made with the leftovers of um, a fermented plant juice. And I just took those solids that were extracted away from those liquids, the fermented plant juice, and I took those solids, I added it to a, uh, a cooler here, and I added uh, a cup per gallon more sugar. There's already going to be a lot of residual sugar on that, but I add a cup per gallon more sugar to that water, um, add more water to that. And essentially what you see here is a SCOBY across the top, like you would see with uh, kombucha. And there's so much yeast naturally occurring on these FPJs that it will culture on its own, but you can add a, a, a kombucha culture in there. I, I do John, which is um, a culture from uh, similar to kombucha, only it's made with honey and green tea. Um, so here I'm making pickles from some cucumbers I, uh, that I grew and um, preserving them in some vinegar that I made from an FPJ. So some of the byproducts are a lot of fun kind of um, from the leftovers, but just remember, you know, nothing is, is waste. Um, here's kind of a stacking functions uh, I like to share, but you'll notice this picture is staged in a large greenhouse. This is a hundred foot by 40 foot greenhouse commercial application. And then I have a hoop house inside of that. And what you see in the front here, um, these wood chips, well, this was a pile, this, this was hemp. So I was mulching down my hemp to use in my, um, as a substrate for growing my IMO3. Now you need carbohydrates and carbon. You can't grow IMO3 on wood chips alone, hemp chips. Uh, you would still need to have a, a good amount of uh, carbohydrate in there, but it is a good addition to an IMO3 pile. That box back there in the hoop house is, um, I gleaned from Chris Trump, he was doing these IMO boxes uh, for storage. So I was making IMO3 in there, but this was during winter time when it was raining um, for weeks straight, it was cold. So what I did was I actually made my IMO piles inside the greenhouse, inside a hoop house. And I was able to do that during the winter time when that would have been very difficult to do outside in that kind of weather. Um, if your IMO3 pile gets too wet, it's just going to go south on you. So um, you can also kind of do a, what I like to call a natural artificial way of uh, collecting IMO where you bring in um, a bunch of leaves and I would stack them inside this hoop house that's inside of the greenhouse. So you're getting two layers of thermal um, insulation there. 
and you could bring some piles of leaves, topsoil and leaves from uh, a healthy forest, bring those and make a pile. And then you could put your IMO collection box in that pile. So this is a way that we can kind of create uh, a, a sort of artificial environment where we're still collecting uh, these IMOs in, in difficult weather. So we can do this in the winter time too. And then the temperature gauge down there, you can see that's my IMO three pile that was in the, the hoop house there and it's up at 110, uh, which is a pretty good temperature uh, when, we're when we're culturing indigenous microbes. We don't wanna go really in higher than, um, really 120 is when we wanna start uh, turning that if we see that pile going above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, nutrient cycling in nature. So, you know, Master Cho always says, uh, you know, when you have a question, just look towards nature. And so I, I do that a lot. And so a good example is, you know, when we're putting our beds to bed, so to speak, in winter time, what do we see in winter? Well, a lot, or, or late fall, we see leaves drop, dropping from the trees, creating a mulch layer that is breaking down into, uh, into humus that's really creating compost and feeding you know, back to the soil, but, you know, animals are a part of this and microorganisms and, you know, so there's, everything is just cycling nutrients. So, um, so anyways, with that set of, of those leaves falling to the ground, we would mimic that. Um, and this is when I apply compost is not right when we're ready to grow or during the time we're growing, you want to get your compost um, on the bed when you're winterizing, you want that to have time to break down um, and get decomposed by these IMOs. So literally looking to nature, um, again, there to uh, kind of have uh, a mm -hmm. way forward. So it, it can be said that uh, indigenous microorganisms are the kind of cornerstone, the foundation of Korean natural farming, really 70 to 80% of Korean outdoor farming is about the IMOs that you're culturing. Um, I like to say the backbone of Korean outdoor farming is the nutritive cycle theory. And this essentially um, gets into the idea that if we're harvesting a plant for a fermented plant juice, let's just say nettles, for instance, um, we want to harvest that plant in its growth stage, whether that's a vegetative stage a transitional stage or a late flower fruiting stage, we want to harvest that um, for a specific FPJ, fermented plant juice or fermented fruit juice um, that will basically be applied to our plants that are our crops that we're growing. It'll be applied to those crops in the same stages that those crops are in. So we're capturing some of these growth hormones. So Fermented plant juices, there's, there's a bit of a misconception I've seen out there that, you know, we're making fermented plant juices strictly for uh, the, the nutrients in the, like um, nitrogen elements, things like that. And actually, first and foremost, it's about the, the growth hormones, the PGR, plant growth regulators. Uh, and these, these hormones work on homeopathic doses. So if you made a fermented plant juice, say, of nettle when it was in flower, and you took that and now spray that on your crop that's in a veg state, well, you can literally put your vegetative crops into a quicker flowering uh, phase because the, these hormones are so powerful. So that's what the nutritive cycle theory um, is about. And I use that whether I'm doing a traditional Korean natural farming fermented plant juice, but I also do that with um, the Jadam method of making uh, a much more simple fertilizer, which is essentially throwing a plant in a bucket of water with a couple handfuls of leaf mold and just letting it putrefy. Uh, I would still um, use those plants in the respective stage with my crops. Um, talk about seawater for a moment. Um, Seawater is used in both Jadam and Korean natural farming. And when we dilute it down 30 times, uh, we're breaking down the ion chains in seawater into those available macro and micro 
um, minerals. And there are over 83 identified elements in seawater. So you're getting the, all those trace minerals. You know, plants need a lot more than NPK. Um, we have all the trace elements as well. Um, the other thing you get with seawater is you get the marine purple photosynthetic bacteria um, and other um, cultures from the ocean. So you're further diversifying the biology by bringing seawater into your farming practices. Um, if you don't have seawater to use, you can use sea salt and um, mix that in as well. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to use sea water, but if you're just using sea salt, you're not going to get these cultures right here. I'm showing you a culture of purple synthetic bacteria. This is phosphorus solubilizing bacteria and um, really good stuff. It's actually, it's not technically taught in KNF, but when I realized when you're fermenting seawater, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is photosynthetic bacteria. And you can see the blooms here on this, the seawater I was fermenting here. Um, so I was like, okay, so KNF actually does teach this, um, even though it was never stated to me, I kind of figured that one out. Um, so, you know, animals is, is a great way to close loops. And ultimately, if we're going to have a full closed loop system, we have to integrate animals into our, our farm. Um, and, you know, you can choose what animals you like to work with personally. Uh, I'm just working with chickens right now. I have worked with goats in the past and cows. Um, but, you uh, yeah, it's, it's really important to bring chickens or excuse me, animals into the equation. Um, okay, so now we'll get into um, some kind of specifics on cannabis and hemp. Um, and Oh, Preston? Yeah. Uh, I think Luke has a question. Sure. Yeah, I'm like not off the screen right now. What's up? Um, so I was curious on the, with the animals, like if there's any permaculture uh, or just like any of these related um, kind of sustainable farming practices that kind of include the interactions with like wild animals as opposed to like a lot of like the, just the domesticated animals. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I can give you some examples of how I do that here on, on the land. Uh, we have a lot of wild turkeys that come around and you know, I just, I encourage them. I, I don't chase them away. I, I leave, so I have a, a, a half acre food forest that I'm establishing here. And I'm going to show you guys some, some footage of that here towards the end of my presentation. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave the gate open. We have a lot of wildlife here, so it has to be fenced off or deer would, you know, come in and eat all of our, our fruit trees. But um, an example of that is I leave the gate open for the turkeys to come in and enjoy. Um, and, you know, KNF doesn't necessarily teach you how to, how to um, use like kind of the wildlife, so to speak. Um, but, but yeah, I think in a broader context of regenerative farming, you know, I, I think that when we talk about the principles again and fostering these relationships, we have to be uh, stewards of the land and, and really watch for the life forms that are around and how can we engage those life forms and how can we incorporate and integrate them into the bigger picture. That can obviously be challenging sometimes. It's like we can't just let deer into the food forest because they would just devour all my fruit trees. Um, but yeah, I think there's a real art form there to, to incorporating um, wild animals and and that's a that's kind of a you know um, a side uh, it, it's a very interesting topic for sure and and you know as I said I, I try to look for ways to do that um, and I'll, I'll show you some uh, some footage of what's going on and um, you can kind of get a better idea of what I'm doing with the food forest um, but Preston, yeah but one one other thing have you thought of grafting your apples and pears onto the tops of hawthorn trees 
so that the the deer cannot access the apples and pears because they can't get close enough to the the tree and then and then you you don't have to worry about fencing well yeah um i mean that's a that's a that's a cool um definitely a cool technique there um you know or you could graft onto a larger rootstock you know um so yeah that that would be cool um I still think it'd be really hard to incorporate, let deer just, you know, walk through, they're going to devour, um, a lot. They, they can do a lot of destruction with, uh, you know, this is a first year food forest I'm establishing. So everything's very young. And, um, a lot of our, whether I'm also doing annuals, but a lot of perennials in there, um, and they're super vulnerable. They can get devoured easily. So, yeah, you, you could uh, do some grafting to try to uh, minimize, you know, the damage from deer, definitely. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna get into uh, just practices I've been using and over the years, what I, some of the techniques I've learned in using KNF Jadam specifically for cannabis. Uh, cannabis isn't all that much different than growing a tomato though. So this could be applied to really a host of different crops. Mm -hmm. um so this is a uh, kind of commercial applications here was a uh, a farm and this is a uh, hemp that we were growing in a greenhouse this was all grown with um jadam and k and f uh this was a field in um butte falls oregon this is a field of hemp this was also all grown with uh k and f and jadam very healthy plants here um, so when we talk about scaling up, you know, from uh, a backyard, say if you're a hobbyist um, gardener, uh, when we scale up, it kind of changes things drastically in our approach. So what I learned was that Jadam uh, gave us a lot of more tools for scaling up and really simplified uh, the approach. Uh, so for scaling up, Jadam has kind of been the saving grace for me. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that more. Um, this is a KNF lab I set up for a farm in, in Oregon. I have another one going here. Uh, I don't have pictures of it at the moment, but you wanna get a nice lab set up with, with all your inputs and everything you're making. Um, you know, here we have our um, fish amino acid, our fish. Um, I was making my own brown rice vinegar there in the corner and uh, lactic acid bacteria and all our IMO collections up there on top, as well as fermented plant uses. There's a bucket of bones there that I was making, you know, water soluble um, calcium phosphate from. So get yourself a nice setup to um, house all your, your inputs and hopefully you can keep those at like a decent temperature. You don't want that to be freezing cold and you don't want it to be, you know, in the 90s uh, or high 80s all the time either that can activate fermentation in some of our fermented plant juices and um, and our other ferments and uh, cultures here. Um, so what I did, um, actually it was at a workshop where the Cho family was in Williams, Oregon and um, Young San Tro said something pretty profound, which changed the, the way that I, that I really approach um, really cultivating anything. And he basically said that, you know, grow your own fertilizer. And, and uh, there was a point at which I, I asked Master Cho, we were at this farm and uh, let's just say a tomato farm. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so there were all these tomatoes growing and then they had all these biodynamic like bioaccumulators and uh, like comfrey and all these other plants. And I asked Master Cho and I said, you know, Master Cho, so would you make an FPJ out of these tomatoes or would you choose like a great dynamic accumulator like comfrey to make an FPJ? And he said, first and foremost, try to make it out of the plant that you're that you're growing. So it's a, it's a bit like plant cannibalism here. Um, but that is actually the best method. If you think about it, it is an analog that fertilizer will be an analog for exactly what you're growing. So um, I really 
that kind of changed my approach. And so when I went back to the farm after this workshop and after hearing him say that, um, at the time we had about four greenhouses, 100 foot by 40 foot, all filled with hemp. And they were, you know, a good ways into their vegetative cycle. They were <clears throat> about 30 inches tall. And I convinced my partners, I was like, man, you know, what we got to do is make some fertilizer out of this. And they kind of looked at me like I was crazy at first. But then I convinced them that we chopped down at least one of the greenhouses of hemp and <coughs> we would make fertilizer out of that. And we still had time to replant that. So we weren't going to be down, you know, any square footage. It was, it'd just be staggered behind a little bit from our other greenhouses and we'd have all this great fertilizer to use. So what I did, what you're seeing here is first I went through, I topped all those plants. This is where all that concentrated growth hormones give her a gibberellic acid and stuff like that concentrated in these plant tips that are in a veg state cycle right here. Um, I made a fermented plant juice out of the tips. And so you can see here on the left, there was uh, the sugar that I mixed in the, the hemp, um, just the tops now concentrated with the um, growth hormones and made this really yummy, delicious fermented plant juice here on the right. You can kind of see on the sides how resinous that is. It's definitely um, delicious by the way wow on your pancakes or waffles um, <laughs> so I, I i did the traditional um harvest of the tops and made the uh the fermented plant juice um <clears throat> with the tops but then what i did is i took the whole rest of the plant here you can see our greenhouses in the back and i just chopped them all up and it's amazing how much mass i was able to fit into these pickle barrels these are like 50 gallon barrels here I had a whole line of them and I just chopped all of our plants after taking those tops off for the fermented plant juice. I chopped the rest of the plant down, including the roots and all into barrels that I made Jadam liquid fertilizer, which is a really simplified method. I'm sure they'll, um, the other uh, instructors there will talk to you guys about that method, but it's very simple. Uh, you, you just chop down your plants into water and toss in some leaf mold. I always kind of joke that Jadam, um, yeah, just whatever it is you're making, just toss it in a bucket of water with leaf mold and, and there you go, you're set. It's, it's very simplified. So this is how I made um, the Jadam liquid fertilizer from the hemp itself, uh, which we were using on all the other uh, crops for that season. So there's a kind of a bird's eye. You can see all those barrels filled up and leaf mold and that second one there uh, to inoculate that and help it break down. Um, but this makes a really great fertilizer. Uh, the smell isn't always the best. I think that's the other thing that turns some people off from Jadam is that through putrefaction and what have you, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's stinky. And some people just are like, oh, no, it's stinky. And, and they, I'm not doing Jadam because of that. But what you can do is you can culture lactic acid bacteria and add labs into these stinky Jadam uh, putrefactions. And that will actually help it break down and it will neutralize the smell. So there you go. There's a little tip to use Jadam and to neutralize the smell so your neighbors don't hate you. <laughs> Um, so choosing plants for fertilizer, if you can't grow your own fertilizer. So, so nowadays, like I always, you could grow a cover crop in the winter time. And when you're chopping that back, kind of like that permaculture chop and drop technique, right? Well, instead of chop and dropping that, leaving it on the ground, you can throw it in a bucket of water and make a liquid ferment. So during the so-called off season, um, you know, you can be growing cover crops and growing your own fertilizer. So um, definitely a, a good practice to get into. And like I said, growing some, some of the crop that you're growing specifically for a fertilizer. I know this is, it sounds crazy to some people, like why would I want to make fertilizer out of my, my crop? And, but it's, um, if you're only doing a small percentage of your field, you can still create a lot of fertilizer for the rest of your crop with that specific plant. Um, so the top plants, um, if you're not growing your own fertilizer, uh, I'm going to share some of my favorites with you here. Um, I would think that they're very similar uh, in North Carolina as they are here in the Pacific Northwest. 
Um, but again, I always urge people to look for what's abundant in your uh, area. Does anybody know what this is here? Mugwort. Mugwort, yeah, this is mugwort. So uh, Artemisia vulgaris here. This is um, one of the top recommended plants for fermented plant juices um, and a, a top recommended herb from Master Cho as well. The reasoning here is that mugwort is high in iron. Uh, it, al it also, like these tops are very high in gibberellic acid and all these uh, hormones, but uh, mugwort also has a high amount of iron in it. Iron is for blood building. And in plants, we're not that much different from plants. Plants' blood is chlorophyll. So for the early stages of, of plant growth, uh, mugwort is, um, is indicated for, um, for vegetative, uh, for that purpose, for that high iron. Um, so dropwort is in the nasturtium family. And this is another one that's high in manganese, which is uh, really crucial for cell division. So also really important for those early stages of plant growth, that vegetative stage of uh, plant growth there. So this is nasturtium here. This grows everywhere on the coast. It's delicious in salads. Um, and this is this, so this is related to watercress um, and has also has a high amount of manganese as well. And so nasturtium is an amazing plant to grow. It's very juicy. So you're also looking for um, when you're making traditional fermented plant juices, you're looking for those plants that are really vigorous growers. They're showing you um, that they have a high amount of hormones in them, um, but they're also juicy. Uh, and nasturtium is, is a very juicy plant for the amount of uh, material you use, you render a lot of juices from um, nasturtium. Um, can anybody, except for any of the uh, instructors, no instructors, please, uh, can anybody tell me what this is? Purslane. Yes, purslane. Purslane is one of my all time favorite herbs. Look, I think this picture kind of illustrates well let's see yeah um you'll see purslane growing in the inner cities out of like sidewalks and what's crazy about purslane is it's one of the most nutrient dense plants on the planet um and it's so it's a succulent i love to make pesto out of it but for making fertilizers it's one of my all-time favorite plants for making fertilizers so here you'll see um Purslane showed up on one of the farms I was at in Oregon and it was just everywhere. And uh, the cool thing about purslane is if we process it in a Jadal method, meaning we throw it in a bucket of water like I'm doing in this picture on the right, um, it will break down in 10 days. 10 days time, it will completely liquefy and you will have yourself a liquid fertilizer ready to go. So um, I guess that's something I should mention here uh, a plant like mugwort, if you were to use this technique, would take more time than, say, purslane. Um, maybe uh, two weeks, I, I might start using that mugwort liquid fertilizer, if not a month. Whereas, again, purslane, 10 days, it's completely liquefied. Uh, it's got higher nitrogen than grasses. It's high in phosphorus, potassium, iron, magnesium, calcium, manganese. And it also um, we'll go back to this picture. You can kind of see it's red. It, it gets more brilliant red than this in its prime. And that's, that's because of the betaline alkaloid in there. And so betaline alkaloid is actually a color enhancing um, uh, substance. Um, so it's enhancing the pigments, it's enhancing the color and the flavor. Uh, so I love using purslane in the, for finishing too, um, for those reasons. Um, all right. Anybody tell me this herb? No. Yes. Also a dynamic accumulator in permaculture. And um, one of my all time favorites. Um, this was my um, great ally and uh, entrance into uh, herbalism was nettles was my first plant that I worked with. Uh, and you know, also a really great plant to make fertilizers out of. It's gonna take longer than that purslane when you put it in a liquid 
fertilizer to break down. I, I would give this a month to break down. Um, but uh, yeah, nettles, great, great plant for making fertilizers out of. Um, we're also looking for plants, you know, that aren't, um, you know, we're not going to damage. We want to use ethical and regenerative harvesting methods. So we never want to go in and harvest more than, say, 40% of a hedge. If I saw this, like, you know, you'd only take the tops of this nettles for a fermented plant use. You leave the roots in the ground for that to regenerate. Um, but if you were doing more of a jadam style and you wanted to take the whole plant, you would never take more than 40% of a wild stand. And that's, that's a good practice to use when you're doing wild crafting. Um, horsetail, Equisetum arvense. Um, there is two kinds of horsetail. Um, use the arvense because uh, it's higher in silica and other minerals, but um, this is also, also yields a lot of juice, horsetail. Um, dynamic accumulator, once again, uh, really goes down deep in the soil and brings up a lot of minerals. So um, a mineral and metal accumulator here and um, a really great trace mineral complex when you're making fermented plant juices or um, Jadam style uh, ferments. Um, this is, um, anybody tell me what this is? Mustard? Oh, uh, close. It's um, uh, anise fennel here. And this just grows like, it's considered invasive. And so let's turn a problem into a solution here. KNF is really good at that. So invasives, um, are generally great plants to use for fertilizers because they're in abundance. We're not gonna harm the environment. Um, we're not gonna damage a plant that um, might be endangered. Um, and fennel just fits the kind of quintessential um, description for that because it just grows everywhere here on the, the West Coast. And it's in total abundance. It's packed full of growth hormones and it's a very juicy plant. So I love fennel. Uh, it happens to be my bees favorite fermented plant juice um, as well. I feed my bees fermented plant juices and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of my presentation. <clears throat> uh, skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage is, um, it, it has a similar terpene profile to cannabis. And this is another one kind of like I was explaining with uh, purslane. If you throw this into a liquid, Jadam liquid fertilizer in a bucket of water, it breaks down very quickly. They're just massive. They get these massive leaves on them, right? If anybody who's seen skunk cabbage in the wild. Um, so, you know, this plant is telling you, uh, doctrine of signatures, if anybody has heard of that in herbalism, uh, the signature here is that this plant is just like, it's massive. It's packed full of growth hormones. Um, and so, you know, this is a great, uh, I love taking skunk cabbage and making Jadam liquid fertilizers out of it. And it does break down pretty fast. I'd say about two weeks, you'll have an available fertilizer. So we have a coastal angelica out here, Henderson's angelica. Uh, and um, I'm sure the, the other instructors there will go over OHN, Oriental Herbal Nutrient. This plant, you can substitute in that angelica. You can harvest this. It does tend to be more potent than angelica sinensis or Korean or Chinese angelica, which is what a lot of people are making um, oriental herbal nutrient from. So keep that in mind. Um, a friend of mine <laughs> has been breaking, for some reason, this is so powerful. It's been breaking the mason jars um, when it's being tinctured, something about it. Um, so maybe maybe choose like a, uh, you know, a stronger food grade plastic instead of a glass, because this is a very powerful herb. <clears throat> um, a few companion plants I love to use for, uh, for cannabis specifically. Here we have yarrow, uh, the understory of cannabis. Um, I love to do companion planting and, you know, I'll, I'll plant yarrow in the beds. I also plant calendula um, and calendula puts off an exudate in the soil that helps um, 
with pathogens in the soil as well, as well as attracting life above. So your multi-stacking functions here. Um, love, love calendula. And sweet alyssum. Um, sweet alyssum has small flowers and it attracts beneficial wasps and predatory wasps. And so this is a good one. I usually plant on the edges of my beds of cannabis. I use this in a commercial application as well. I just barely planted a bunch of alyssum seeds on, on the edges of our brand new um, nice. cannabis beds we just installed. Um, so getting back to that point that I was making about the, the nutritive cycle theory and harvesting plants in their respective ages, vegetative transition or flower fruiting. Um, here you can see uh, I'm making a JLF. I threw in a bunch of different plants into this JLF and this was specifically uh, tailored for a, um, a flowering stage of my, my crops. You can see in here, I have Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot flowers. I do have some purslane that was in flower. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's chicory. Um, chicory is another really great, um, chicory is another great herb to use. It was brought to the United States from Europe as a cattle feed and uh, is also a dynamic accumulator. So it's really great to use in liquid fertilizers as well. It's, it's going to be tough to get a lot of juices in a, uh, like a traditional um, fermented plant juice, but I would, I love using that one in a Jadam liquid uh, permit. Um, so getting into more of the pesticides now, plants that we can use for pesticides. This is going to be strictly the Jadam approach. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, Korean natural farming, you will be using strictly preventative measures. There's really no recourse for uh, an infestation if you get an infestation. So that's where, again, pairing Jadam with can up. I, I love it because it gives you more tools in your toolbox here. So um, the natural pesticides, this is strictly Jadam. And um, here are just a few of the herbs that you can use um, as a pesticide. We have my personal favorite here on the West Coast, Bay Laurel, um, California Bay Laurel, geranium, hot pepper, uh, Korean pasque flower, garlic, um, bracken, fern, oleander, monk's hood, red spider lily, foxglove, tobacco, Jerusalem artichoke's a great one, easy to grow, um, garden balsam, peppermint. Um, so these are just a few. Um, now you can experiment with different plants that you have, excuse me, growing in your area. Um, for me, I use bay laurel for a host of different pests and, and it's been working great for me. So um, that's kind of my go to, but use what you have there available to you. Um, here on the right, I've shown Jadam wetting agent. This is a liquid soap that we make in Jadam. Uh, it's a surfactant and a wetting agent. So it basically what it does when you team it with these Jadam herbal solutions, that we make out of these different herbs. When you team that with the wetting agent, the soap here, what you're doing is you're, you're creating this vehicle to drive that, um, the constituents from these plants. The wetting agent will help deliver that and drive it into the pests. You can use this in feeds as well and it helps deliver that and drive it into, um, helps the plant assimilate those nutrients more. So it's, I use Jadon wetting agent in all of my feeds and all of my uh, IPM um, pest sprays as well. <clears throat> it also helps to, like if you're using it in a soil drench, it helps to penetrate hydrophobic soils. So that's another use there. Um, I should mention that um, I did mention earlier that I have a YouTube channel and I put out videos. I have a lot more content that <laughs> I see you. Just <laughs> um, so uh -huh. this is, this is uh, one I put out recently about making this soap. Um, so right here, I'm teaching you how to make this soap. Now the Jadam 
YouTube channel is also amazing. There's so much free information on there. It's ridiculous. Um, just a wealth of information. Yon San Cho has, has dedicated his life to just giving it away for free. It's amazing. Um, so I, I basically follow the method from the orange book right here. This is the large batch size, 26 gallons that he recommends. Now they're in the new book there that I have on the side, the green book. He does share some smaller batches. You can kind of downsize as you, as you need. Um, but I always just love to make a large batch because I use this soap mm -hmm. for, um, for hygiene, for, um, you can use it for your laundry. You can use it for your dishes. You can, I, I love making soap now. And I, I, I'm so grateful to, um, Yang San Cho for teaching me how to make soap. It's, it's very similar to make hard soaps as it is liquid too. So if you kind of learn this, um, technique, you can swap out potassium hydroxide with sodium or yeah, sodium hydroxide and make a hard soap. Um, there's California Bay Laurel. That's what it looks like. And this is one of my top, as I mentioned, my, my favorite pesticide to use. Uh, you can make a, a really nice roasty coffee, a little side note here from roasting these seeds in the fruits there. So here were some hemp aphids that you can see on the left. Um, we had a really bad infestation uh, in these greenhouses. And on the right there, this was after an application that I used the bay laurel with the wetting agent. And those aphids all turned red and black. They're, they're dead. They, they turn dark colors after they, they die. That was after one application of the Jadam um, pesticide, the, the bay laurel and JWA, Jadam wetting agent application. Um, I did two applications over a period of uh, a week and we had this just nasty infestation and I took care of like 99% of the aphids. Um, when you have an infestation this bad, it's really, really hard to get rid of them all. So obviously preventive measures are great. CANF gives us a lot of tools for that, but Jadam on the back end really helps when we have problems like this. And so you can see how effective this was spraying that bay laurel. Um, okay, now I'd like to kind of get into speaking about the soil um, and inoculating and building soil. <clears throat> so this is more for commercial applications. And what I'm doing here on the farm, Farming Humboldt Dreams is a farm that I currently work for. And we're literally building uh, these, these beds We've been building them in the last couple of weeks and like days away from planting here. We just got our first shipment of plants. So really exciting. Um, so this is a cross section of a natural, like the earth. And obviously wherever you're at, they, they fluctuate, you know, not everywhere has an over horizon, an organic um, topsoil. So really degraded um, places, you won't even have an over horizon. But I mean, the, what we're trying to do with KNF is build that O horizon through, with these beneficial IMOs. So if we recognize that naturally the earth strata has these stratas, right? Uh, if you take a cross section through the earth and it also creates a natural filter. So this is kind of, this is kind of, this applies to regenerative farming, but this is not really necessarily it is related to KNF, but I was not taught this in KNF. So I'm kind of, I'm sharing some extras here. Um, so here, taking this uh, soil horizon uh, section, let me show you how I'm applying that kind of theory now. Here's a little detail I drew up. I used to be a draftsman. And um, so mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm taking that soil horizon approach to build soil and I'm using that in a commercial. So all of the beds that we have here uh, on this cannabis farm, I've, I've used soil horizons mimicking nature, right? So <clears throat> right here, what we have is on the very bottom, um, there's river stone, about four inches of river stone, and that's gonna create a filter, um, just like the bedrock, the, the parent material bedrock shown in this cross section. Um, and above that, what I've done is 
I've installed some, some PEX tubing and I'll get into this. This is really exciting. We're gonna do some, some heating in the beds using uh, radiant heating through PEX. Um, but above that, the, the river rock, we have composted wood chips. I spent about six months using um, Jadam uh, microbial solution inoculating wood chips and breaking them down over the winter. And, and so essentially what we have here is something similar to a hugo culture, where I've used those composted wood chips now above the natural filter we created with the stone. And above that, we have um, a subsoil, uh, which could just be native soil from your area. Um, what we're doing is essentially just um, bringing in a nice commercial um, topsoil from uh, Royal Gold here in Humboldt County, um, just to start with a nice blend uh, of, you know, it's it's got a nice blend of organic, um, you know, good compost and everything you need, good structure in it as well. So um, on top of that, you know, we always do a cover crop and a mulch doing, you know, natural farming methods. And uh, I'm using uh, Dutch clover or, um, New Zealand white clover is also supposed to be supposed to be even more um, drought friendly than Dutch white clover, uh, but that, that's a nitrogen fixer, and it will also create a nice you know low growing uh, cover crop. I would get I'd be really careful about the cover crops you choose. I have seen um, you know in commercial applications where. Uh, they just threw out a random mix of cover crop that had like vetch and legumes and all these different climbers and it climbed up into the canopy and competed that, you know, with that canopy. Um, so I'd be very careful about the cover crops you choose. You want something that's going to be low maintenance. It's not going to outcompete your crops. And uh, so typically I, I like the ground per slain because I can also make um I can also make uh, fertilizers out of that. And I can, um, you know, the clover is low growing and, and that's also a nitrogen fixer, as I, as I said. So um, here's a picture of the beds that we're installing. You can see the wow. PEX tubing that I've run across the bottom. This will have radiant heat. We're trying to do three different back-to-back um, -back kind of uh, bumper crops. Uh, so, you know, my, my partner wants to grow into the winter to do that. We're going to have to create heat in our greenhouses and we're going to have to use artificial light. Uh, so this is how I'm going to bring in heat in our beds. You know, um, a lot of people just say, no, burn a bunch of uh, propane, you know, in, in the air. And well, we need our heat to really be focused in the soil, not necessarily the air and you're burning a lot of propane to heat those greenhouses. So how do we maximize efficiency and use as little materials or resources as we have? Um, here is uh, some of the beds that were finished recently. And you can see the PEX tubing sticking out that will connect into my, my hydronic loop once I have my, um, my heating source going. And I'll talk about what that heating source is gonna be. It's really exciting. <clears throat> okay, let's play this. Uh, I'll play this little uh, video to show kind of the process of that. Wow. It's always exciting. kind of the process there and you know um I know. <laughs> right yeah for real 
So what we did was we put down the pecs and the rock. We put the composted wood chips on top of that. Now, you probably noticed the bobcat was driving over the wood chips, and I had, you know, a couple hardcore <laughs> um, no-till enthusiasts reach out and they're like, hey, man, well, you compacted all those, those chips. And I'm not, I'm not worried about compacting the wood chips. Actually, whenever you make a hugo culture, you, want, you don't want any air pockets or space in there. It's going to settle drastically. But we didn't crush the topsoil, if you noticed there, when we put that in. Um, so the wood chips we did uh, compress as we were putting them in with the bobcat, but it saved us a lot of man power. And um, so just a note there, I did get some criticisms for that, but our topsoil <laughs> was not um, compressed. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna do with this PEX tubing in the bottom of the the beds here and our horizontal beds is um, Gene Payne compost water heater. I would really um, encourage you to look into Gene Payne and his methods. He's a genius in composting. Uh, and he used basically a compost pile to heat water. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing is using a Gene Payne style compost water heater. So we'll be making compost and we'll be capturing that heat to pump through our greenhouses and that PEX during the cold months. Um, and you're making stacking functions. You're making, not only you're not burning energy, say propane to do this, you're making an input for your farm. You're making quality compost for your farm. So it's stuff like this that gets me super excited. And so you can kind of see the uh, diagram here we have the PEX tubing that's run through our compost pile, <clears throat> and that is on a hydronic loop that connects into our, our greenhouse, a reservoir that pumps into our greenhouse, all that PEX tubing, and will radiate that heat through our beds. Um, here's another, it's kind of hard to see, but essentially what it is, is uh, you build a mound out of uh, hay bales. It's about a 12 foot diameter. Um, and you build uh, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a hay bale perimeter. And inside that you're using wood chips. You can add, um, you can add um, other things like sawdust has been added to these and also um, different, um, let's see. Um, yeah, basically green wood chips, sawdust, and animal manure. Gene Payne himself had a method where he did not add any nitrogen, no animal manure. Um, and, you know, there's debates on, you know, there's so many ways to compost, but, you know, typically 70% carbon to 30% nitrogen is, is a common way of composting. And Gene Payne figured out a way with this to aerate, so this is an aerobic fermentation um, that's happening here. This is a no turn, um, a no turn pile. So it's a static pile, okay, uh, being aerated through his methods. Um, and so this will create a really nice compost without having to turn that. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Just it minimizes any kind of uh, extra work that you have to do to to create that and he figured that out very carefully without adding any nitrogen or manure and what he was saying is you know he found that his compost had all this nitrogen in it after it was made solely with using carbon and you know he was hit out of had all these scientists baffled like well how did you get all that nitrogen in your compost if you didn't add any you know nitrogen any you know manure in there um and what it is, is these microorganisms, okay, that are helping break down the wood chips. Well, they're, they're, um, they're fixing nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen. So, so if you get your pile the right consistency, you have airflow, these microbes are what are adding that nitrogen to the mix. Um, I'll talk a bit about biochar here.
So I'm a huge fan of biochar. Um, there's kind of mixed feelings on biochar. And I think probably where some of the most, uh, shall we say negative sides, like um, opinions on biochar come from people who haven't charged it first. If you just make biochar, toss it out on the land uh, and expect it to work, well, there's a kind of a process to biochar and, and that's called charging. So um, I don't have time to get into the specifics for charging biochar, but what I will say here is um, I have another YouTube video on my techniques on my uh, YouTube channel. So check that out using KNF and Jadam methods for charging biochar. <clears throat> um, you know, biochar is an amazing amendment. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding to, to what it is. I've had people tell me like, well, no, you don't need to add that, just add humus, like living, like, you know, organic matter. And that really misses the point of what biochar actually is. It's very different than adding just organic humus to your soil. What biochar is, is uh, a carbon sponge. It's essentially, you're adding a, you're, you're sequestering carbon through a process of pyrolysis. So it's a very specific way of burning. And I will have some um, educationals on making biochar on my YouTube account soon. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're starving the fire of oxygen and you're sequestering the carbon. So you're not gonna see a lot of smoke in your, your fire when you're using pyrolysis because you're sequestering carbon. Um, and what we're doing by charging is actually filling those voids, that porous area in the biochar, we're filling that up with minerals and microbes, and then we're adding it to the soil. So biochar can ask, last a very long time in the soil, multiple generations. Uh, if you've ever heard of terra preta from the Amazon, this is an ancient Amazonian biochar they were using thousands of years ago that has created some of the most fertile uh, soil on earth and it's and it's uh, regenerating to this day. <clears throat> so biochar I say you know it's kind of a slow process to make it but it's not an amendment we have to you we have to add every single year. It's a slow process to make with long lasting benefits. but charging is absolutely crucial. And again, check out that YouTube video for uh, more detail on that. <clears throat> so here's a picture of uh, an IBC tote, which is like a close to a 300 gallon tote. And uh, this is a picture of the biochar sitting in that tote, uh, mm -hmm. soaking up all those nutrients and microbes. So essentially I was adding all these different inputs from KNF and Jadam. Jadal microbial solution in here. So we're soaking in all these microbes, minerals, and nutrients. Um, and the final stage of that, which I show in my video, is we can add that biochar into our IMO3 pile. And this way, the fungal IMO that we're collecting, we can actually grow that into the biochar. <clears throat> so here it is, the video I was referring to, um, bio charging biochar with KNF and Jadam. Um, this was uh, the first little uh, project I had to demonstrate. Um, excuse me, real quick. First project I had to demonstrate using IMO and also biochar. It's a little, mini farm in Arcata, California. And all I did here in this greenhouse, a friend of mine said, grow whatever you want in here. And the only thing I did, I was first starting out with KNF and I had my IMO two collections I, I had, and I grew, I made some IMO three, cultured that on a pile of, of mill run. And then I charged my, my biochar um, with that IMO, three that I made. Um, and you can also make a liquid IMO, a limo as it's known, and put your biochar on that to charge it. So the only thing I added to this, and it, it was very, um, you know, it was, a, it was a nice texture, this soil here, but it was depleted of any nutrients. 
the only thing I added to this was biochar and IMO3. And for instance, this, this borage over here, these leaves are massive. Um, this lettuce, I mean, it just exploded. This whole greenhouse just exploded. And all I added was IMO and biochar. So it was just crazy to see how well this worked and how healthy these crops were. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's too, yeah. Um, and, and I grew this uh 11.2 pound <laughs> rutabaga. I was very proud of the <laughs> rutabaga <Awesome>. I grew. <laughs> that that's so one, awesome. Was that in one season? I'm sorry, was that in one season? That was in <laughs> one season, yeah, of applying IMO3 and biochar. It looks like you're holding a baby. <laughs> it is baby. It is. It has parental love. <laughs> so yeah, I was just blown away to see the results. I wasn't even using the full regimen of of KNF or or adding any Jadam at that point. I was very new to it, and um, I was just blown away to see like, wow, just off of IMO and biochar alone, um, you can grow some amazing crops. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears. Um, I kind of shared some of uh, more of a commercial application, a bit of what I'm doing there here on, on the farm, but I also have this little food forest that I'm very proud of. And uh, it's just a fun little project. So this is kind of more of a permaculture approach uh, using perennial crops. Um, this was the winter time. And so this is about a half acre plot fenced off here. And it was sitting fallow for several years. And, you know, at one point in time, somebody came in here, they terraced out. It's got about five levels of terraces here. And uh, it's just been a really fun little piece of land to work with. That big tree in front is a big eucalyptus tree. So there's all, already some kind of few trees established with medicinal value. Uh, so kind of working with what's already there. Um, so we did get some snow in the winter time. And here we are, we went and bought um, about 60 fruit trees and shrubs um, mm -hmm. to go plant in here. And so this is a new, that's my little cabin. That's where I'm speaking from right now. Um, and you can see um, here from mm -hmm. this view, uh, all the mushrooms that have been popping up <laughs> from adding the general microbial solution. So during the winter time when it looked like this after the snow melted I was spraying a lot of Jadal microbial solution and soaking that in and then essentially th this was a, a fig that I planted and this is what it looks like um, currently there on the right so it's you know it's really coming into full bloom and a bunch of figs uh, are forming on that um, but after the JMS essentially what I did was I just cardboard mulch sheet mulch with cardboard um, it doesn't look the best, you know, when, when you see it like this, but <clears throat> cardboard is an amazing resource to use for sheet mulching. Um, and I have access to a lot of cardboard. So we sheet mulched with cardboard. We inoculated with Jadal microbial solution and went through and planted this particular terrace right here was all blueberries um, down to some fruit trees on the end there. And then um, well, I'll just play this little quick tidbit. As I'm pulling apart this cardboard that's been outside getting rained on, I'm noticing all oh, this mycelium, mm -hmm. beautiful mycelium mm -hmm. just growing throughout it already. Just naturally around. The spores are already there. We're just basically giving them something to grow on. So that was just after um, there had been some rain in the wet months. The, I, I laid the cardboard out and it just already started blooming with mycelium before I ever added any inoculants. So another reason I love cardboard is, it, is the mycelium will just start eating it and you can help spread it through the topsoil that way. So this is what it looked like after we added the cardboard. <laughs> then I went through, I'm up in the... Um, eucalyptus tree here and looking down then we came through and we added straw on top of the cardboard 
So that looks a little better than uh, the cardboard, but um, again, the cardboard just, it adds such a nice protective layer and really holds the moisture in and helps spread the mycelium. And then on top of um, that, uh, I've added wood chips now. So I started with um, cardboard and then I went to straw and now I'm bringing in uh, loads of wood chips and um, play a few more. I recorded this uh, yesterday. So this is all really um, brand new content I've only shared with you guys. Wow. And you can see um, I have chickens running around free range. Um, so I'm integrating them into uh, the farm. Here we have um, there's some Hopi tobacco uh, I planted, but this is kind of uh, some grapes here. And um, I'm walking towards the area of the food forest now that is the perennial herb garden I'm establishing here. Um, walking past some sage and some rosemary. We have some skullcap there, like there's skullcap, uh, some sage. So establishing this uh, perennial, that's uh, motherwort, that's uh, valerian there with the white flowers. Um, some mugwort behind that. Um, just establishing all those perennial herbs that I love so much, that's uh, angelica and uh, aurelia, californica, some thyme there, some ladies mantle, um, and then we have some, some mullein in the corner, some more grapes, some Jerusalem artichoke, um, and some fruit trees. So it's a very, very young, you know, and we're just bringing in mulch and inoculant. This is an elderberry. Um, definitely needs to get fertilized here soon, but uh, you can see the fruit that is growing on the trees. So with a food forest, uh, model really what we're doing is establishing the big trees first you'll notice on the ground there there's kind of some shrubby um, berries a lot of berries between the fruit trees but we're establishing those sentinel large fruit trees that are really the the first thing we established in a food forest here and then I come back and I plant um, the ground and fill in the space but I'm basically just adding a lot of wood chips here. Uh, here's a peach tree. Uh, this was all planted this year, by the way. <laughs> and you can see well, that's a gooseberry there. So I have some shrubs, but adding a lot of perennial perennials that will come back year after year. Um, it's not going to be solely perennials. I have um, some raised beds in here that I'm also doing, um, you know, some veggie crops as well. There's our chicken coop back there. This was an old structure that was there that was all disgusting and dilapidated. And uh, my girlfriend and I, um, we remodeled it into a chicken coop. <laughs> Nice. There's um, some plum. Yay. So, you know, you have to have a long term vision more for these are um, boysenberries. It's more mm. of a long term vision for, for a food forest. You know, I'm doing some occultation down here with tarps, a great way to do a no till and deal with these weeds. You can see there's a lot of grasses around. Um, mm. And I'm just using occultation with tarps to. Uh, lay those down and suppress those weeds out. It also turns weeds into fertilizer. And when I lift these tarps, you'll see mycelium running everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Walking into our, uh, this is a Korean natural farming deep litter chicken coop that we've installed here. Um, 
This is my girlfriend applying um, the top layer, which is basically pine shavings here. We have about a foot of wood chips with uh, the pine shavings on top of that. And so you're creating a deep culture here. When we add in the IMO3 <clears throat> um, together, the IMO3 along with the wood chips there and that deep um, litter system, it creates a no smell uh, chicken coop. And then at the end of the year, or, you know, this one um, is pretty deep. It probably lasts a couple of years, but you know, when it's ready to change out, this becomes an amazing amendment for your garden bed. So all that nitrogen and, you know, um, different minerals and, and nutrients um, from, you know, basically uh, chickens, um, has leached in and soaked up in all this this wood and the IMO is helping break all of that down and so this is uh great to to pull out and add to to the garden so about every year I'm just going to add more wood chips and start over and then I'll pull that out at the end of the year that will go into uh my my raised beds and anywhere I'm um growing crops so a great way to close loops right there with animals using the, the deep litter system. <clears throat> um, beekeeping, I also have an, a small apiary here. And um, this is a recipe for Master Cho. You know, he's, I don't think he was ever a beekeeper, but you know, he did. I, I have figured out that in many ways, Korean nuts, Korean nuts are farming applies to really everything. So. Um, you can use it for beekeeping, you can use it for animal husbandry, for gardening, farming. Um, and so this is a recipe you can use for a, what you do is put this in like a water bucket traditionally, um, but I'm uh, here, I'm adding straight fermented plant juices. Um, these were some uh, nucleuses that I got this year and I'm adding them to some new beehives and I'm pouring um, fennel FPJ my bees favorite FPJ they love it and I feed my bees straight fermented plant juices that I make from dehydrated uh, honey crystals uh, and this is made with fennel as I mentioned so really the applications for Korean natural farming go way beyond um, plants uh, and of course you can always jump in your pile of IMO <laughs> yeah. or get a sauna <laughs> um, you know, this is like very serious therapy in, in Korea. They take this very serious. I think in the States, uh, it's catching on a little more, but, uh, you know, this is essentially infrared um, probiotic therapy here that, that yeah. we're doing. And this was the middle of uh, winter. It was freezing cold outside, but inside it was just very nice to jump in this pile and uh, take a little, uh, you know, just in, enjoy the end of the day here after a hard day's work. Mm -hmm. um so permaculture design with knf i've already i mean i'm i'm i started with permaculture so it's already ingrained in everything i do and some of the stuff i've already shared uh has a lot to do with permaculture but i'll just share a design that uh i i did for a this is an acre um as kind oh, of yes. just, uh just an idea that I had for how do we create a Korean natural farming farm with permaculture design? So we're not compromising Korean natural farming by using permaculture design. There seems to kind of be this idea sometimes that you have to choose permaculture or you have to choose Korean natural farming. You can't do the two or you're, or you're somehow you're compromising or you're not like a purist and 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 i reject that i don't i don't buy that at all because again we go back to the principles and um the principles are what matter and the principles from my experience um you know they're they're one and the same between korean natural farming and permaculture and it's interesting that um you know i think humans we just do it naturally it happens in high school as we all know where we form our little cliques and our little groups. And um, 
you know, and, and it's just funny because, you know, I've been the Korean natural farming guy, like giving lectures at permaculture convergences. And it's like, wait, guys, I started with permaculture. So I am a permaculturist, but yes, I use these techniques too with permaculture. So um, anyways, I, I just like to stress that because, you know, there seems to kind of be this idea that you, you can't use them together and you most definitely can. Um, it very much, Korean uh, natural farming, it uh, complements um, permaculture. So here what we have is a permaculture design where you see the zones laid out. Here in the middle, I have a little cabin and then that's zone zero. From there, the zones kind of reach out to um, zone one with the culinary herbs and our greens that we would be, you know, those are our zone one is where we're most often spending time. Um, zone two, we kind of branch out and then zone three, we get into, you know, kind of the perimeters of the property and like more of our food for it, uh, you know, orchards, things like that, um, that don't require as much maintenance. Um, so, but this is designed to be a closed loop Korean natural farming farm in a permaculture zone protocol. Um, the greenhouses up here are heated by IMO three and four piles that we're making in the greenhouses. One of these greenhouses, it's, it's, uh, has a tropical environment. So we're able to grow um, cinnamon in there. We're able to grow cane in there. We're able to grow some of these um, tropical plants in this greenhouse that we wouldn't normally be able to uh, grow in a temperate climate here like the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so, and we're heating that with our IMO piles, our composting. Um, some other things I can point out about this design. Um, it has a little apiary. So really this has uh, room for chickens, goats, that would be grazing on the land. And then my um, apiary, the beekeeping. Um, so those are kind of the, the <laughs> animals that I like to work with. Um, I'm not really into um, pigs like like some people are. I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, but hey, whatever um, whatever suits your fancy, whatever you're into, you can design this for your lifestyle and you know what you're into. So um, the other thing I'd like to point out here is to the left of the central cabin is the covered kitchen. This is kind of designed around influenced by um, Yang San Cho at the Jadam farm. They have this really cool um, little cabinet that they all have their meals in. And it's all situated around uh, the central area where you could have like a cook. Um, so kind of like that Korean barbecue style. Um, and it, it, so this would be set up for like doing um, different workshops such as the one that y'all are at out there and um it's got a little fermentation storage here uh we're growing very specific plants to make fertilizers and pesticides out of um i do incorporate some raised bed kind of traditional uh annual um crops as well and there's an imo spore sauna here um we have a rocket hot tub or um, like a rocket stove hot tub, or we could also use that gene pain method of composting and capturing that heat as well. Um, there would be water catchments on all of the roofs here and catching that water. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the design and um, coming towards really the end of my presentation. So, um, let me know if you have any questions. Any questions for Preston? Yeah, I have one. You kind of hinted at it earlier uh, regarding uh, invasive species, uh, plants. You make those into a fertilizer, correct? That's right, yeah. So I can give, I can give you some examples here. Blackberry is known as being very invasive, fennel, um, we have English ivy that grows through the redwoods. Um, that is, yeah, 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 that's packed full of growth hormones. So 
we can take that and make fertilizers out of all of that. And it's packed full of growth hormones. Would, when using the invasive plants, would it be, is it better just to use the whole plant and leave it whole when you put it in the, the, the water or do you chop it up as, as fine as you, as small as you can get? Yeah, it doesn't matter. When you're, it doesn't matter. When you're doing Jadam, you don't, you don't have to chop it up. Um, it might help the, it might help it break down a little faster, but it's really right. rip the whole plant out of the ground and throw it in a bucket of water and just let it putrefy. It's really it's super basic. Okay. And then a follow up kind of in the same job, uh, area, tree stumps. I got an area that it's covered. It's got several tree stumps. Do you have, would it be a what, good way to, um, you, a tree uh break down those tree stumps with uh i really don't know how, how else to sit, put it <laughs> good idea well it's, it's been, they may make your maybe make a raised bed type thing around around the stump um i mean you could figure out that could be like a design element on your farm i've seen people carve those out and make them planters if you got like a um a stump uh, grinder and ground that up you could right. you know, now use those wood chips to do whatever you know mulch with um or just make it some kind of fun design feature in your in your yard a, a little table or something like that yeah and, and they're, they're pretty much too low to the ground of the table but i'm just trying to utilize it without grinding i guess just kind of uh Break it, but still break it down and not grow a tree. I don't want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll play around with that. I appreciate your input. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, get creative. Definitely. <clears throat> Any other questions about um, combining KNF and Jadam? I know the instructors there will go over, um, you know, all all <clears throat> the, all the other stuff, making all the inputs, but. Specifically to like combining canap to dom. Um, Question. Yeah. What's your um, ratio or how many mils per gallon are you using when you do your jadam your jadam for the liquid fertilizers? I want you to tell you. Doing the four four mils per gallon or eight mils per gallon? Oh, um. You're talking about applying Jadam with liquid fertilizers when that's ready to use. How much am I applying to uh, my feeding regimen? Yeah, what's the dilution rate? Um, so it's it kind of varies. Um, <laughs> it's and if you look in the Jadam book, he does he like he'll give you he'll give you um kind of windows to work with. Uh, but generally, um. I am diluting down uh, Jadam liquid fertilizers um, about one to a hundred. Okay. Thank you. They're not going to be as potent as um, fermented plant juices. Fermented plant juices are all homeopathic. That's our traditional. Yeah. Can -up. The Jadam fertilizers <laughs> are much more watered down. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Thomas, can you hear yes. me? Yes, I. Did you, uh, did you well, have any questions for Preston? I do. Uh, but we, boy, I'm gonna ask Preston. I just want to say thanks a lot. This has been a very uh, inspiring uh, uh, 120 minutes plus. Uh, I took many many notes, and I'm really happy and grateful uh, for the opportunity to get to listen to your presentation, Preston. That was really that was really something there. Awesome. Uh, it, you mentioned uh, in the first half of your talk, you talked about um, the nutritive uh, cycle theory, and uh, a, a couple of times you also touched upon the vegetative uh, cycle theory. I was just wondering if there's, you know, some good book, a uh, piece of literature where mm -hmm. uh, I might be able to, you know, delve deeper into that theory. 
There, there is a book. However, it's only in Japanese. And actually, I've been trying to find somebody to uh, translate that. Um, but essentially, so okay. So you you mentioned um, like the vegetative, the vegetative um, cycle is part of the nutritive cycle theory. Yeah. So that's just basically the nutritive cycle theory is essentially saying that you know plants go through phases and during those phases the whole biochemistry changes in the plant so if we're harvesting that plant at any given time we're capturing that biochemistry in the veg stage in our transition stage and in our um, fruiting flowering stage um, and so master cho or originally got this idea from a japanese teacher and he did write a book um, on this and, um, and I wish it was in uh, English or other languages that we could, you know, decipher this, but it's, as far as to my knowledge, it's only in Japanese. And, and what, what uh, we know of it has been filtered um, by Master Cho to us. Let's see. Well, thank you anyways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, I want to uh, introduce this class uh, to uh, Thomas. Uh, he is in uh, Germany and he is going to be an, uh, an instructor eventually. And um, so I'll tell you his documentation of his processes when he's making these inputs is so incredibly flawless. He has um, set the standards so high that you're all gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. It's amazing documentation. Um, I am humbled because it was better than mine. So you've set the bar very high, and I appreciate that. And eventually, um, so I don't know if I've told you, Thomas, but um, CGNF Hawaii it has decided to become very um, focused on Hawaii, which is fine. So we're going to be forming uh, CGNF Jadam North America. Um, and at some point, we'd like to have you translate the basic manual into into German. So that's that's coming up. That's that's your project for next winter, Thomas. <laughs> yes. I'll be very humble to do that. Well, you know, your English is flawless, so you're the man to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. It's exciting news too about that uh, formation of the yeah North America. <clears throat> yeah, well, and, and we would like you involved in that, Preston. That we, we hope that you'll consider being on the board. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely. Um, any other questions uh, for Preston? Just a quick one. When we make the, I don't know if it's called the liquid fertilizer or whatever it is that we harvest, the, whatever the plant stage is in. So let's say, for example, if we wanted to use it for like the growth um, to use like the, the tips of it and then for the flowering stage to use the flowers. Um, at any point, would that be like stunting the growth of the plant if we were to harvest it too early for like the beginning stages or, or, or even at the flowering stage? Well, yeah, so whatever you're harvesting, you know, this kind of gets into um, being really, um, careful about what we're harvesting for fertilizers um you know we don't want to go harvest um you know uh like dandelions in in the yard you know to, to make a fermented plant juice uh for a commercial farm it's just going to take forever to try to do that right so so that's why i really shared the specific plants that i did because those are are plants that kind of fit these the criteria for me that they're in, um, they're abundant, they're juicy, and they're full of hormones. Um, so I'm very specific with plants that I use. I don't, I don't just randomly go use um, any plant. Um, I, I really look for plants that meet all that criteria. Um, and so, so yeah, you want to look for those plants that are in, um, that are abundant, um, and. So that being said, if you're picking the tops off those tops, yeah, you, you will stunt, likely stunt that plant from reaching its full potential for that season. It's going to regenerate because you're only taking the tops off of it. But, um, 
you know, this is why we, we look for, um, you know, large fields of, of mugwort or nettles or, or things that are in abundance that uh, we don't have, again, we don't have to pick things from the yard that like we, we like mm -hmm. the ornamental value or something. Okay, thank you. Sure. Is that it? Thank you, Preston. Preston thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, thank you. Your, your, your talk was very inspiring. We appreciate everything that you do. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I hope to. Um, well, you're still here with us, so there you go. <laughs> right. On. I hope to make it out in person someday, but it was, uh, it was an honor. Uh, dropping in with you guys and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your workshop. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Preston. You're very welcome. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Aloha. 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 Cheers. Aloha. I'll see you soon, bud. <laughs>